This week on ANN, the Seventh Day Adventist World Church holds a special general conference session with just one item on the agenda. Adventists in the South Pacific and around the world are waiting on information from Tonga after a volcano erupted on the island. And in Nigeria, Adventist Possibility Ministry provides Braille Bibles. These stories and more coming up. Thank you so much for joining us this week. First in the news, delegates to a special general conference or GC session voted to allow the inclusion of a new section to the general conference constitution that would enable delegates to participate in digitally in a future GC session in the event that unforeseen or unavoidable circumstances arise. The unanimous votes took place during a one-day, one-item session at Venice Church's headquarters in Silver Spring, Maryland, United States, on January 18, 2022. The GC Constitution Amendment vote would allow delegates to participate in the upcoming GC session to take place on June 6 to 11, 2022, even if they cannot physically travel to the venue in St. Louis, Missouri, due to the lingering impact of the COVID-19 pandemic. Due to current travel restrictions, the delegates for the special January 18th session were chosen using primarily individuals who currently work at the GC headquarters in Silver Spring. These delegations were approved by each division and consequently voted by the General Conference Executive Committee on September 16, 2021. The GC Executive Committee would still have to make a decision at the appropriate time based on the current circumstances, whether the GC session would be held virtually, in person, or as a hybrid of the two. Thank you. Not For more information on the GC special session, along with background information and deeper in explanation of the GC Constitution right. leading up to this event, please visit Adventist.news. Seven-day Adventists across the South Pacific are anxiously awaiting news of family and friends following the eruption of a huge underwater volcano near Tonga on Saturday. Communication with Tonga remains limited due to damage caused to the main undersea communication cable. Trans-Pacific Union Mission President Maveni Kalfononga says, My heart and prayers go out to my people in Tonga. Having no communication at all with them can be very frustrating. However, I am trusting in God who is everywhere and so loving. He is the one that is taking care of them better than we can. Kalfononga is from Tonga. The eruption of the Honga Tonga Honga Ha'apai volcano caused a tsunami which inundated parts of Tonga Tapu, Tonga's main island and other nearby islands, and triggered tsunami warnings for several other countries. ABC News is reporting that Tonga's capital, Nuku'alofa, was covered in a layer of volcanic dust, which has contaminated water supplies. Staff from the Tonga Mission Office reportedly evacuated to Beulah Adventist College after the tsunami hit. Church leaders are encouraging Adventists worldwide to continue to pray for the people of Tonga. We will keep you updated on Adventist.news as more information is released. The Adventist Possibilities Ministries of Eastern Nigeria Union Conference, or ENUC, recently presented sets of Braille Bibles to several blind students in an effort to enhance the mission of the Seventh-day Adventist Church to the visually challenged. The presentations were made as part of the year-end meetings of the ENUC. Director of Possibility Ministries for the region, Solomon, Solomon Noak Jaik, said the Braille Bible is a tool to give visually impaired a sense of belonging and participation in worship and mission. It will also de deepen the church's impact in her mission to all the world, including those with visual challenges. Geraldine Yunwer Madu, a 16 year old girl from the ABBA North Conference, received one of the four Braille Bible sets. While expressing her delight at the gift, Enwer Madu demonstrated the use of the Braille Bible by reading from Judges 2, verse 1 to 3. She has been blind since she was one year old, and she became blind because of a poorly managed eye surgery. Advanced Possibilities in Eastern Nigeria also donated a set of Braille Bibles to Babcock University and Clifford University Libraries. While making the presentation, ENUC President Basiudo reiterated the commitment of the union to ministry to the physically challenged. We are reaching the deaf through sign language. Now, we are also focusing on the blind using Braille and other tools, he stressed. 
Elijah X added that the target of the ministry is to establish the Adventist Academy for Integrated Special Education so that the blind, deaf, and physically challenged can be fully empowered, spiritually and mentally. We want people like Geraldine to find a place for education where they can also learn about Jesus. The Seventh-day Adventist Church in Ghana has submitted a memorandum to the Parliament of Ghana calling for an amendment to the date of general elections in Ghana. General elections are held on the constitutionally mandated date of December 7th every four years. In 1996, the date fell on a Saturday, which Seventh-day Adventists recognize as the Sabbath. This disenfranchised many Adventists who chose not to go to the polls. The 2024 elections will also fall on a Saturday, and church leaders in a proactive stance are petitioning Parliament to consider an amendment based on the grounds of religious liberty. President of the Southern Ghana Union Conference, Thomas Techi Okran, making the submission in December, told a constitutional review committee that the current inflexibility around the choosing and fixing of general elections, which sometimes operates against members of the Adventist Church in particular, and other Christians in general, should be rectified through an amendment. Okran said, an amendment as proposed above would make it possible for all Ghanaians to exercise their franchise and discharge their civic responsibility without being made to choose between their faith and civic responsibility. Ghana's constitution holds the power to amend the constitution in parliament and for an entrenched provision like election dates, parliament is required to submit the bill calling for votes in a referendum of the amendment. At least 75% of parliament needs to vote in support of it. Ogren said, it's a long and daunting process, but as a church, we must start the conversation and work to see carried through with God as our helper. Coming up, food is more than just eating, according to one married couple. We'll be right back after the break. Nicole and Victor Bouchet consider themselves missionaries and entrepreneurs who serve the greater Worcester, Massachusetts area. Not only do they advocate for those in need, they teach cooking classes and run two vegan nest cafe restaurants slash markets in Worcester and Clinton. For them, food is about more than eating. The Bouchettes are featured in the December 21 Adventist Journey magazine. Nicole Roche. I am originally from Plano, Texas, which is a little town outside of Dallas. And I'm currently living here in Massachusetts, in Sturbridge, Massachusetts with my family. Um, and then we have the Veganess Cafe in Worcester and Clinton. Growing up in Texas, you know, um, sort of big on farming and cattle and all of that. Um, so my kindergarten field trip was to a slaughterhouse. And going through that experience, I was absolutely horrified and made the decision that day that I was going to be completely vegan, completely plant-based. I didn't know what it was, I was only five years old, but I just had decided um, and felt very convicted that I wanted to, you know, abstain from eating animals. And as I continued to grow, um, I, you know, it, I started focusing also on the environmental impact, on the health impact, all of these different aspects of why I personally felt um, that it was so important to, you know, abstain from eating certain things. And being a Christian, I had never really made that connection. 
Fast forward to my early 20s when I met my husband who was raised Seventh-day Adventist and he explained to me, oh, well, you know, this is something that actually my church really believes in, in terms of eating very healthy and being very mindful. And there's actually a strong spiritual component. And um, this is when we were dating and I started studying more about that. And I always say, I, I really found um, my experience of how to live for God in that because I was like, wow, people who love Jesus and don't eat meat, these are my people. <laughs> and um, so that's really what got me studying. And um, throughout the course of us dating is, I was going to the church, I was learning more and more. I first came into the health message and then into the Sabbath truth. And then um, pretty much right after we got married, I made the decision to be baptized. Yeah, and that was almost 10 years ago now. My name is Victor Brochet, and um, I grew up in New York City as a seven-day Adventist. Um, currently, um, I and my family and I, we are the hands and feet of Jesus. Um, we operate a center of influence in Clinton and Worcester, Massachusetts, and pretty much all the surrounding areas. Um, We do a lot of cooking. Uh, we do a lot of teaching. Uh, we do a lot of praying, um, and just um, overall embracing um, our church and the community. Yeah, when we first got married, we were pretty much living for ourselves, and we weren't really interested in church or anything. And um, actually, it was her dad that first started us, got us to go back to church. We started going to a Sunday church, and. Um, um, to accompany her dad, and um, and then that's when my dad stepped in. It's like, oh, you know, I want you I want you guys to come to church, and then you know, we kind of um, started going to church with my dad also. And um, uh, her dad lived in um, Philly, the Philly area, and my dad lived in New York. So when we would visit her dad, we go to church with him, and obviously when we we're in New York, we would go to church with my dad, and. Um, and I just got to a point where I said, God, I said, you know, I can't do this the same way I did it before. You're going to have to show me something different or I, I, you know, I can't be a part of this. And from that moment, I've had a supernatural experience. My entire family had a supernatural experience with God from that day forth. So you know, be careful what you ask for, but praise God for what you ask for. <laughs> when we first really started going back to church, um, 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 I had met one of my childhood friends that was going to church and I actually met him in the subway and, you know, we talked a little bit. He's like, you need a ministry. I'm like, what's that? <laughs> He's like, I'm, I'm gonna come over your house tonight and I'm gonna show you. And, and he came over, over our house and like, oh yeah, you need to you know, get, um, have a name and you need a website, you need, you need an Instagram and all these things like, oh, okay, you know. And um, you know, he w it helped us, you know, God always brought people to help us at different points of everything that, you know, that we needed to form his ministry. Cause you know, we're, Honestly, we're just the caretakers of his ministry, you know, and it's um, uh, funny how God just provides and just puts all these things in place for you. It's kind of funny because I think one of the really exciting things about the restaurant is that we're not just a restaurant. I always joke about how I actually forget sometimes that, that we are a restaurant because we have all of these other aspects. You know, it's such a community oriented space um, that it doesn't feel, you know, like work. It is, it's very laborious, you know, and we spend a lot of time here, but we're just so invested in what we're doing and it's just so incredible. Um, and speaking to that, unlike I think most restaurants that you go to, we actually operate off of a platform. And sort of the platform that we seek to draw attention to is the very real issue of food insecurity 
and health inequity and looking at um, you know disparities in how people have access to food, how people um, have access to education around food, um, and you know just the health outcomes that are associated with that. And looking at you know various things, whether it's you know um, socioeconomic lines, looking at racial disparities, you know whatever the case may be, um, there are many ways in which you know at different times different people are sort of left out of the question around food. And so that's something that's very, very important to us to address through the cafe. Um, and we do that in a number of different ways. So culinary nutrition education is just a big way of saying that we love to cook and we love to show other people how to cook. And we love to show them how to make things, um, you know, not only delicious, but nutrient dense. And so what we try to do is through these cooking classes, through the nutrition education, show people how to combine different foods to get the most nutrients out of it um, so that they're able to heal their body or you know, uh, abstain from certain things to avoid disease um, and to be able to maintain you know, a basic level of health whether they have access to the medications that they need or not, at least they're able to do as much as they can through food sources and, you know, other means, you know, through exercise, through nutrition, right, looking at the eight laws of health. Um, but it gives us sort of a springboard to be able to say, here, here are some things, like, you're not helpless, you're not powerless in this situation. You actually have things that are very simple, that do not cost any money, that are available to everyone to help you to maintain a basic level of health because health is, um, you know, it's not something that's to be bestowed upon, you know, the deserving, <laughs> it's freely given, you know, and that's, that's incredibly important to us. Um, and that speaks to sort of the advocacy work that we do as well, right? So making sure that people know what things are available to them, speaking up for the people who don't know um, where to get that information, speaking up for the people who um, maybe have suffered adverse health outcomes and who need a voice. November 5th, 2017, we opened up the Veganess in Worcester. Um, years later, um, right before the pandemic, we signed a lease to open up the Veganess in Clinton. Um, there was a brief pause on that, um, but in the meantime, God had us doing various things. Um, fast forward to now to the um, spring of 2021, we opened up the Veganess in Clinton. And to, uh, I guess, God's reward for us for that is that um, the thing that we desired in the beginning, which was the food truck, um, he has granted that to us, um, and we just received a, a grant from the Boston Celtics, the Viciprint, and NAACP um, to, to monetarily fuel that. Although it's a small portion of what needs, uh, what we need to build out the entire food truck, it's a you know it's a start, and and that's how God works. You know, He gives us a start, and He wants us to be patient, and then He'll. He'll provide the rest later. So I have no doubt that God is going to provide everything you need for the uh, community food truck. So the, the, food, the food truck is going to be all donation-based, fair exchange. Um, sometimes we will take it to festivals um, just to have our presence there, but the bulk of it is just service, community, and outreach. And we are still learning every single day, but the incredible thing is, is that God is on this journey with you. And my husband always says, um, it's a quote from, I think Ministry of Healing, I'm not sure where he gets it, but it says, um, Sister White says, God alone is responsible for our success. And that's truly it. We just have to step forward. We have to go forward in faith. Um, it's kind of a back against the wall situation. You're either going to do it or you're not. And when we made that decision to go forward, there was no turning back. It was put our faith in Christ and just keep going. And so I just say like, you're not gonna get it all right. You're gonna make a ton of mistakes. Um, <laughs> you're probably going to nearly sink <laughs> whatever it is he's given to you a couple of times. But um, keep going, keep going, have faith and stay focused and God will see you through.
You can find more stories like this on vimeo.com slash NAB Adventist and nabadventist.org. Coming up, David Trim is here for This Week in Adventist History. But up next, Adventist Mission shares the story of a house that turned into a hospital in Sri Lanka. Hi, Bio. How are you? Are you okay? Dear Bio. I can't even remember how long we've been staying at home now because of this virus. For now, it's just nice to hear your voice and see your face. Nothing beats playing outside in the dirt though. Which reminds me... Are your hands clean? Yeah! Mommy and Daddy says not a lot of kids get COVID-19. But it's always nice to be extra safe. We should wash our hands before picking our nose. <laughs> Washing our hands protects us, but it also keeps us from spreading the virus. In case we touch something dirty, let's always be clean and safe, okay? Love, Joey. Why is there evil in the world? Christians hypocrites? Is the Bible a fairy tale? Does Jesus love everyone? Church doesn't feel relevant to my life. Is God even real? You have questions? Let's talk about it. I believe Bible. Welcome back. Thanks to the 13th Sabbath offering in 1959, the Adventist Church in Sri Lanka purchased a plot of land with a house on it. That house turned into a clinic, then a hospital, and now the hospital has opened an urban center of influence. Adventist Mission has more. What was once a regular house quickly became an essential building in Sri Lanka. Thanks to the 13 Sabbath offering in 1959, the Adventist Church in Sri Lanka purchased a plot of land with a house on it in Kandy, a city in the central province of the island. The dream was to start much needed medical work. The house served as a clinic with two physician's offices, a treatment room, and a pharmacy. The clinic grew to be known as a hospital, and in 1967, another 13th Sabbath offering provided the funding to purchase the adjacent land to expand the hospital further. At the time, Lakeside Adventist Hospital was one of only two full medical care providers in Sri Lanka's second most populous city. Other 13th Sabbath offerings in 1972 and 1976 allowed for the hospital to construct a new building and expand its services. With the expansion came the need for additional staff, so a two-year training course was started. In 2019, the hospital opened an urban center of influence to facilitate the hospital's outreach efforts, like stop smoking programs and community health screenings. This space is inclusive to everyone, regardless of religious background or social status. Many of the hospital staff and patients who are not Adventists love being a part of the activities. Over the past year, a core group of 30 people worship every Sabbath in the hospital chapel. So far, 10 have completed Bible studies and are waiting for baptism. All of this was possible because of your support of the 13th Sabbath offering. From the first offering they received in 1959, God has been leading this group to spread a message of hope in Sri Lanka. You can contribute to projects like this every quarter. Thank you for your prayers and support of the 13th Sabbath offering. Watch this and other mission stories online by visiting AdventistMission.org, then click on videos at the top. And finally, for today's episode, let's turn to David Trim for a look at Adventist history. 
This week, we hear of the ministry of Thomas and Catherine French in the Sierra Leone and the Gold Coast. Welcome to This Week in Adventist History. On January 18, 1911, American missionary Catherine French died in West Africa in the British colony of the Gold Coast, today's country of Ghana. In May 1908, Thomas and Catherine French, both teachers, accepted a call to go from the United States as missionaries to Sierra Leone. They sailed from America in July and arrived in Freetown, Sierra Leone, in August 1908. Both suffered from malaria while in Sierra Leone, but they survived for two and a half years, during which they both taught at church schools, while Thomas French also pastored the Freetown Church and trained nationals to serve as missionaries in other parts of West Africa. Late in 1910, Thomas and Catherine were asked to move to the Gold Coast to Axim, site of a mission school, where they arrived soon after New Year 1911. They had been there just a few days, when on January 17, 1911, Catherine was taken ill with a severe attack of black water fever. She lived only one day, dying of heart failure on January 18, 1911. Thomas wrote Catherine's obituary for the main church paper, The Review and Herald. In it, he writes of how I stood beside my dying companion a few days ago and realized that my own strength was fast failing. And he goes on of how he was in perplexity. But he used the tragic description of his wife's death to make an appeal to our people at home to support our workers in these heathen strongholds. Brethren and sisters, seek God earnestly in behalf of his cause in West Africa, was his conclusion. A deceased spouse's survivor sometimes suffered from the same illness, and certainly they did not swiftly recover from the emotional impact of a loved one's death. A colleague wrote of how Elder French was greatly reduced in vitality as a result of overwork and the sad experience he was called to go through. It is a reminder of how much Adventist missionaries suffered in order to make this truly a worldwide church. And that was this week in Adventist history. Thanks for watching ANN. Join us next week for more news from the headquarters of the Seventh day Adventist Church. Did you know the Adventist Church has a YouTube channel where you can watch in and video, in and in-depth, and plenty of other amazing videos on prophecy, health, and Bible study? Just go to YouTube and search for the Adventist Church. Click the subscribe button to make sure you're caught up each week. And remember, leave a comment or a prayer request. We have people who are praying for you 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. Before we say goodbye, here's some good news from the book of Psalm, chapter 196, verses 8 and 9. The passage says, Let them give thanks to the Lord for his unfailing love and his wonderful deeds for mankind. For he satisfies the thirsty and fills the hungry with good things. That's our program for this week. And remember, you can always visit Adventist.news for daily news and videos. Until next time, God bless. Take care.